I love you. Sometimes referred to as love bug or love letter for you, but it's actually a computer worm that infected over 10 million Windows personal computers after the 5th of May 2000 when it started spreading as an email message with the subject line, I love you, and the attachment, love letter for you. The malware was created by Onel de Guzman, a then 24-year-old resident of Manila, Philippines. Because there were no laws in the Philippines against creating malware at the time of its creation, the Philippine Congress enacted Republic Act No. 8792, otherwise known as the e-commerce law, in July 2000, in order to discourage future iterations of such activity. Onel de Guzman, a college student in Manila, Philippines, who was 24 years old at the time. De Guzman, who was poor and struggling to pay for internet access at the time, created the computer worm intending to steal other users' passwords, which he could use to log into their internet accounts without needing to pay for the service. Despite the fact that his thesis was rejected, he chooses to do it anyhow. The student writes the last line of code that he originally developed, at first the file looks to be from a secret admirer, but once you open it, the full file extension reveals itself. This is a visual basic script, it uses an exploit in early computer systems, that allow it to run system code, simply by being opened, the top two files are sent to the Windows system folder. Where they wait the bottom one is sent to the Windows directory, where it creates its own key, in the local machine registry. This causes other programs to run as soon as the system boots. Before the user even has a chance to log in. From there, it opens Internet Explorer, and randomly picks from a series of four web pages. Once landed, it downloads winbugsfex.x, then it adds another registry key. At the starting line, it gathers the system login password, IP address, and remote access information packages it up neatly, and sends it to mailme at super.net.ph. After receiving the information, the worm looks for files with extensions, like .js or .css and replaces them with the file extension. It also replaces JPEGs and MP3s, making them entirely unrecoverable. Once the worm has done its harm, it opens Outlook and looks for emails before sending itself using the originator's email address. Destruction is now spreading through a message of peace and love. From the Philippines to Hong Kong, the virus has infected several large corporations and banks, not only deleting important files within the companies, but also grabbing the email addresses of all individuals in contact. From there, it jumps to Europe, where it reads specific damage to the email servers within the House of Commons, forcing them to shut down, as well as the Danish parliament with classified documents. When an email fits the description command, it sends a TCP reset to that desktop, instructing it to cease accepting emails for variable. The enough sector is not so fortunate. Most firms, like AT&T and Ford, use Outlook, and they are obliged to take their email servers offline. Along with the emails, the virus has already infected over 55 million machines. A second spreader, known as MIRC, has been discovered among the initial files. Any this checks the machine for an IRC client, and if one is discovered, it immediately distributes the exploit to any contacts that the victim may have on a server, rather than a love letter, however it sends this message believing it's a legitimate file. Only after executing the script would tech-savvy IRC users identify the name of the author of Merck, but they know he had nothing to do with it. Security experts are scouring the malware for indications as to its origin. They find that a component within closely resembles a password. They find that a component within closely resembles a password cracker named. That was discovered four months earlier, they find within its signed names and resumes. An entry that says, in the resume portion is an extended list of first and last names along with a group title this traces back to an after-school club at a computer college in the Philippines. An apartment is raided, inside is a man a woman and an empty desk. With a dusty outline of a gateway performance 1500. The man now identified as Romo Ramones, the boyfriend of Irene de Guzman who is the older sister of a student from the college. ARPANET was the first wide area network that allowed different connections to send information to each other. Also known as packet switching, tries connecting to the number through his home. Modem sure enough he's gained access to the University of California Berkeley diving. Further he discovers there's potential government documents hidden behind a password, he tries guessing. He tries UCB. Over the next few weeks, Dante continues logging in for him. It's less about obtaining sensitive information or leaking it was more about gaining power, snooping around, seeing how far he can cross the line. 
On one of his deep dives he makes a fatal error. He forgets to mask his login name. This error lights up a silent flag miles away at a security office but unknowingly he continues. The college kid answers the door. He's greeted by the Los Angeles police. They seize his computer, but since he's underage he isn't charged. In the back reaches of a Menlo Park storage facility, two workers are clearing out unpaid storage units. It was a routine job but in this particular unit they find something. The Stanford Research Institute one of the centers impacted by the previous escapades reaches out to Kevin, proposing him to work for them, securing their network. The 18-year-old is hired, he's successfully gone from an underground black hat hacker to a white hat hacker. With a paycheck detective James Neal of the Menlo Park he thinks he's looking at the standard case of stolen property. The storage bill is assigned to a John Anderson. A quick search finds this name to be fake. Upon further inspection of the unit the detective finds blank ids, and a document containing an unpublished number of the Soviet embassy. A few pages back another document was found containing the name. Kevin Dante. The National Bureau of Investigation issues a mandatory court appearance for two students Anil de Guzman who originally proposed the thesis and the Michael Buen who is suspected to have helped write the structure of the worm. They are nowhere to be found. The worm continues its spread. Though the effects are beginning to weaken, a press conference is called. The guest of honor, Onel de Guzman when asked, if he's the one who unleashed the virus. And if he feels anything about the damage caused. He looks down almost nothing and covers his ears being the first large-scale computer crime out of the Philippines. The authorities have trouble charging over the subsequent months the Philippine Congress passed legislation dealing with computer-related crimes but seeing as this was made official after the issue he can't be charged. Ultimately the case against him boils down to credit card fraud, but he never admits to creating the virus only that he may have inadvertently released the program. All charges against him are dropped in total the estimated damages are said to exceed $7.8 billion. Twenty years later he finally admits to creating the virus and releasing it he said he did it alone. Polson is brought in for questioning he denies everything. A few hours later they accompany him to his condo inside they find a room full of more equipment. One of these is a lineman's headset. This device can be connected wherever there are exposed telephone wires accessible when connected to a line. The handset is essentially indistinguishable from regular telephones. Except it can intercept active calls answer incoming calls and make outgoing calls. Back then you needed a license to operate it something Kevin is lacking. They confiscate some of the equipment and start their investigation among the obtained documents. And equipment they find a series of pictures. A young male, crouching down and picking the walk of a Pacific Bell trailer. Further pictures show the same subject inside the telephone trailer posing with it over the past four years. FBI agents silently surround Kevin's home in North Hollywood. Then the leader's phone rings. The agents immediately trace the comm only to be led straight to a Pacific Bell number. Instead of jumping down and heading out of country, Kevin decides to stay close to home. A TV show has just aired an episode about Kevin's hacks. Speculate about what motivated Kevin Polson. Those who knew him before he fled agree that he's an unusually talented and bright young man, possibly a genius. But now he is a wanted man, facing up to 37 years in prison. Prison, prison, prison. The show opens their phone lines to callers that may have tips about the subjects. On the premiere of this particular episode the phone lines are jammed. Brian Bridges a employee at a store working the night shift spots a familiar face. The store clerk dials the authorities ensuring Kevin doesn't spot him by the time they arrive Kevin was gone. For the next 24 hours the agent on duty Terry stakes out the parking lot. Kevin pulls up, Terry takes a position at the front door. Two clerks sneak up behind Kevin and tackle him to the ground. Hearing the commotion Terry runs in and handcuffs him. They bring him into the back room until transportation can arrive. As if on cue Kevin begins complaining, that his eyes are watering, he requests that he take his contact lenses out, and get the glasses from a bag in his car. Terry agrees, and retrieves the bag but he did not check it before handing it over. Sure enough in the glasses case was the universal handcuff key. Polson is being held in a federal lockup. He calls his sister, and mentions that the police quote, they have my address, she recognizes the phrase, and calls one of Kevin's hacker friends who subsequently retrieves an incriminating computer from an undisclosed location. However, 
The police are a step ahead months earlier they recruited a local hacker to infiltrate the local Ella hacker circle he rings the bell and the incriminating computer is intercepted it takes nearly nine months for them to decrypt it. Nearly two years after his arrest Polson is accused of 19 counts, that include conspiracy fraud in connection with access devices. Interception of wire or electronic communications and money laundering. He faces 100 years in prison and nearly 5 million in fines. This is considered one of the first large-scale cases against the newly defined crime of hacking. Eventually Polson pleads guilty to several counts of computer fraud mail, fraud wire, fraud, and money laundering he's ordered to pay 58k in fines, and given a 51 sentence. Okay, this is, this, this is the question, did I ever consider leaving California altogether and going across the country? Um, I, I did consider that, but, and I think this, this might be part of the hacker mindset, I wanted to solve the problem, not run away from it.